What's up guys, this is Mr. Eldridge, and in today's lesson, we're going to look at the Roaring Twenties. The Roaring Twenties, and specifically looking at the various aspects, including American economic growth, culture, uh, literature, artistic expression, and all of the various aspects that come along with the 1920s. Known as the Roaring Twenties, the 1920s saw substantial economic growth and an increase in overall American wealth relative to the rest of the world. Several factors were at play, including the decline of European production following a destructive and costly war, the returning payments of United States loans to European uh, countries during World War I, innovations in production techniques, and easier access to credit for American businesses and consumers. With World War I being the first industrial war, it also took a massive toll on European economic output. Costs and time to repair were high, and sources of labor were low, leaving the situation ripe for American businesses to fill the void. Additionally, Henry Ford revolutionized the effectiveness of production with his assembly line. By placing specialized workers in consecutive stations, they assembled their portions of the vehicle or whatever product and the vehicle moved down the line to the next station. Using this method, pre-made and uniform parts were mass produced and aligned for setup. The cost of labor and time it took to provide cars far exceeded that of the traditional assembly line uh, of the entire car at once. Lastly, available credit lines allowed businesses to start and grow more easily. And with only small portions of the total loan, consumers were able to purchase many goods such as refrigerators, radios, and cars, paying them off slowly over time. By the 1920s, there was a whole new host of opportunities for immigrants and migrants. The expansion of factories, corporate entities, new machinery, and new techniques such as Henry Ford's assembly line allowed for goods to be produced much cheaper and much larger quantities. As such, the amount of factories and jobs greatly increased and thousands of immigrants and rural migrants flooded the cities in the 1920s and 1930s. One large group of migrants were Southern Blacks. The mass migration of Southern Blacks would later be known as the Great Migration, as thousands of African Americans migrated to cities such as New York, Detroit, and Chicago from the declining agricultural South, particularly in the manufacturing heavy First and Second World Wars. Additionally, when drought began to plague the Midwest, many rural farmers also began to migrate to the West most notably California. Lastly, Latin American immigrants skyrocketed beginning in roughly the 1920s as a loophole in the United States immigration policy. We'll discuss this in a later uh, time period that allowed for essentially unlimited North American immigration. This meant that while many of the regions the world would be substantially limited based on past immigration, migrants from Latin America and even Canada later were able to flood in and work as manual laborers for southwestern agriculture, most notably as farmers and laborers for the United States fruit industry. As the amount and price of consumer goods rapidly improved, culture began to shift to one of consumerism. Spending money on appliances and luxuries, as well as new popularized forms of entertainment, such as movies and national sports broadcast via the radio, we see a change in the American landscape by introducing celebrity culture with actors such as Charlie Chaplin and sports such as Babe Ruth. Such technology, such as the radio and more easily available telephone, further enhance communication and the spread of new ideas, music, movies, and other forms of art. Additionally, minority groups such as the African-American musicians and writers of urban America were able to develop their own unique cultural art and music. With examples such as jazz and the popularization of the blues, black culture began to revitalize in a movement that started from New York known as the Harlem Renaissance. 
The Harlem Renaissance was an intellectual, social, and artistic explosion centered in Harlem, New York, spanning the 1920s. At the time, it was known as the New Negro Movement, named after the New Negro, a 1925 anthology edited by Elaine Locke that put together essays, poems, short stories, and other artistic works by prominent black artists. The movement also included the new African-American cultural expressions across the urban areas in the Northeast and the Midwest of the United States, affected by the Great Migration, of which Harlem was the largest. Poems and art by figures such as Langston Hughes combined culture of northern cities with that of southern culture, most notably New Orleans. While many people enjoyed these new developments, another group of people had a slightly different perspective on the consumerism and urbanization taking place in the 1920s. A movement that would be known as modern art began to take root in urban America. Modernism was a philosophical movement that, along with the cultural trends and changes, arose from wide-scale and far-reaching transformations in Western society during the late 19th and 20th centuries. Along with its critique of industrial society and the trauma experienced during World War I, modernism rejected the certainty of optimism of enlightenment thinking and many modernists rejected traditional religious beliefs. Modernism, in general, includes the activities and creations of those who felt the traditional forms of art, architecture, literature, religious faith, philosophy, social organization, activities of daily life, and sciences were becoming ill-fitted to their tasks and outdated in the new economic, social, and political environment of an emerging, fully industrialized world. Alienated writers such as H. L. Mencken who published the magazine American Mercury, attacked Christian fundamentalism, American politicians, and small-town America. Others, such as Edward Hopper, used paintings such as the work Sunday, which features a lone man sitting and looking face down at the street to illustrate the detachment and alienation experienced by many industrial society. Now, after the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, Americans and other Western societies feared a violent communist uprising in the West. As such, a period of paranoia and sometimes unconstitutional persecution took place in a witch hunt-like atmosphere where citizens were desperate to weed out any potential communist or anarchist revolutionaries. This era was known as the first Red Scare. The second will come in the 1950s with a wave of paranoia instigated by United States Senator Joseph McCarthy. Many were unjustly ostracized, imprisoned, or even convicted in some select cases. None received as much popularity or attention as the execution of Sacco and Vanzetti in 1927 to Italian immigrant anarchists who explicitly supported violent opposition to oppressive governments. The evidence against Sacco and Vanzetti was weak by contemporary standards and appears to have possibly been tampered with by law enforcement or other parties as a setup. Regardless, they were found guilty for the murder of a guard and paymaster and executed via the electric chair. While controversial instances such as this were extremely rare, it showed the potential danger of right-wing paranoia in the West, while left-wing paranoia would wreak far greater havoc in the Stalinist USSR and Maoist China shortly after. Additionally, there were groups such as the Ku Klux Klan that were revitalized as the number of immigrants surged in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Mostly coming from East Asia as well as Southern and Eastern Europe, the KKK shifted its focus from simply targeting blacks to all groups they considered as, quote, un-American. In a broad move, the KKK actively recruited and condemned the presence of Catholics, Jews, immigrants, communists, blacks, and other groups that were, quote, not white. While certainly a minority movement, they were influential 
in pushing legislation to slow immigration, such as the Immigration Act of 1924, and taking a more general isolationist international approach. The KKK was largely responsible for a sweeping lynching movement of blacks in the 20th century. It should also be noted, too, that the KKK was in support of programs such as the America First program, as well as supporting the slogan, America must remain American. The Immigration Act of 1924 was a United States federal law that prevented immigration from Asia, set quotas on the number of immigrants from the Eastern Hemisphere, and provided funding and an enforcement mechanism to carry out the long-standing ban on other immigrants. The 1924 Act supplanted earlier acts to effectively ban all immigrants from Asia and set a total immigration quota of 165,000 for countries outside the Western Hemisphere. This would be an 80% reduction from previous laws. These quotas for specific countries were based on 2 to 3% of the U.S. population from that country as recorded through the 1890 census. The purpose of choosing the year 1890 was to promote immigration from Western and Northern European nations, which were incorrectly thought to be more intelligent and genetically superior to Eastern and Southern Europeans and Asians in supporting the idea of eugenics. Such beliefs on intelligence were a result of the formation of Lewis Terman's Stanford Binet IQ test. This test was formed to measure the relative intelligence of individuals through a standardized test, and at the time, only Western and Northern European states had compulsory education. As a result, their intelligence scores were disproportionately high compared to the rest of the world. This development led many Americans to believe that Northern and Western Europeans were genetically superior to the rest of the world, which at the time suffered from low intelligence scores due to their lack of compulsory education policies. As a result, populations poorly represented in 1890 were prevented from immigrating in proportionate numbers, especially affecting Italians, Jews, Greeks, Poles, and other Slavs. The Scopes trial was an American legal case in 1925 in which a substitute high school teacher named John T. Scopes was accused of violating Tennessee's Butler Act, which made it unlawful to teach human evolution in any state-funded school. Rather, it was a requirement to teach creationist views in Tennessee's schools. Scopes purposely incriminated himself so that the case could have a defendant to attract publicity to the issue. The trial served its purpose of drawing intense national publicity as national reporters flocked to Dayton, Tennessee to cover the big name lawyers who had agreed to represent each side. The fundamentalist side was going to be supported by the famed William Jennings Bryan, presidential candidate in 1896, who famously gave the Cross of Gold speech. While representing the American Civil Liberties Union and Mr. Scopes was the famed Clarence Darrow, infamous defense attorney and often seen as one of the greatest defense attorneys in American legal history. The trial publicized the fundamentalist modernist controversy, which set modernists who said evolution was not inconsistent with religion against fundamentalists who said the word of God as revealed in the Bible took priority over all human knowledge. The case was thus seen as both a theological contest and a trial on whether modern science should be taught in schools and represented a clash of ideals between modern science and religious beliefs. Scopes would go on to be found guilty and would receive a $100 fine for his actions in teaching evolution in a Tennessee public school. Thank you so much for paying attention to this video. If you have not hit that subscribe button, please go ahead and do so now. Thank you so much. Have a great day.